I think that uh, Andre can share his screen. Okay. Yeah. There was kind okay. of a so delay there. You... I can't hear anything now. We hear you, we are here. Oh, okay. I should start already. All right. Okay. Yeah, you can start your presentation. All right. So, I, I mean, I can hear you. So, please ask questions uh, during the lectures. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I should say it's like 5 a.m. here. So, my son is going to be waking up in like an hour a.m. at home still. So, if he comes into in here, that might be like a two, three minutes to stop. Okay, but that probably is not going to happen, but it might happen. Okay, so um, let me share my screen. Oh, you can already see my screen. All right. Can you see the screen now? I guess so, right? Not yet. No. Oh, you see the, sorry. I have to share the screen. All right. Share. Okay. Okay, but. Uh, okay, what is it now? It's here. All right. You should be able to see it now. Yes. All right. So, you know, if you write, a, I can probably look the chat, but it will be kind of hard for me to look the chat during the talk. So please try to just ask your question. And if someone sees a question in the chat, just please read it out loud for me. Uh, otherwise, try to just ask the question because it's kind of hard for me to write and read at the same time. Okay, so uh, these lectures are going to be about stochastic thermodynamics, so there will be no, no attempt of going through complicated math. I'll try to use very simple models to illustrate concepts. So, you know, I'm going to call this introduction to stochastic thermodynamics. Okay, so maybe call this one. So there will be three lectures. And so, you know, this field, so a few words before I really start. So it's it's fair to say the field started in the mid 90s. Okay. That's where, that's pretty much when people discover the fluctuation theorem. That's like 95, 96. So first with um, Bowen, uh, Evans, Morris, and Cohen, and then Galavotti and Cohen. And also with Jasinski, those were, you know, they are different relations, but they come from the same thing. They, 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 they I mean, they're, they're both fluctuation theorems. They, they have, it can be expressed in different forms, but, you know, and when they were doing it, I mean, there is a one year difference between the works, but they did not really understand the works were related or, or I mean, how they really didn't, they had an idea they were related, but they didn't understand how exactly. So, you know, this, the discovery of the fluctuation theorem can be considered the start of the field okay, of stochastic thermodynamics. And, and then you know, after that, uh, with experiments and everything, the field really pick up some traction. Now, you know, Edgar was just talking about molecular motors. So if you want a picture to represent stochastic thermodynamics, a good picture would be this one. So imagine like a train on a track. Okay, that's supposed to be a train. There's a train on a track, train is moving forward, okay? And that would be thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is the science of how to transform heat into other forms of energy. And if you want a picture for a stochastic thermodynamics, you do the same picture or the analogous maybe. And you know, I don't really know how to draw a molecular motor, but that would be like a molecular motor, okay? Molecular motor on a track is the experiment you can do. 
Now the molecular motor on the track is supposed to represent stochastic thermodynamics. Now, what's the difference between these two pictures? Well, I mean, uh, one difference is the number of degrees of freedom, right? So for the train, you have like 10 to the power of 23 degrees of freedom, or, you know, probably way more than that, but you know, you, you have a very, very large number of molecules that make the train. For the molecular motor, it's just a single molecule. It's a big molecule, right? A complicated one, probably, I don't know, 50 times bigger than a water molecule, linear size. Um, but you no, know, it's just a single molecule while the, the train is made of many, many degrees of freedom. Now, if I watch a movie of the train, I can only see the train moving forward. I'm never gonna see the train moving backward. I mean, no. I mean, the train might move backward if it wants to move backward, if there is a very, I mean, that, that's possible. But um, I mean, there are no fluctuations that will make, uh, that will see you, that you will see the train moving backwards. If I watch a move with the molecular motor, on average, it moves forward. But, you know, because the molecular motor is not, it's bigger than the water molecules, but not that bigger, the collisions between the molecular motor and the water molecules, if the motor is in water, um, will make the motor fluctuate, okay? So, you know, big, big difference between the two pictures is fluctuations. The second case is stochastic thermodynamics. Fluctuations play a major role, okay? Now, of course, there are fluctuations in thermodynamics, but the kind of fluctuation I'm talking about, I mean, if, if you just imagine the thing moving forward, if you watch a move the train again, you are never gonna see the thing moving backwards because of fluctuation. That's pretty much impossible to see. While for the molecular motor, that's a quite common occurrence. Um, uh, the molecular motor is out of equilibrium. Now the train is probably out of equilibrium also, but you know, when we do thermodynamics, uh, we can only talk about equilibrium states. Now, the really, really remarkable thing about equilibrium states is that they they can be expressed. I mean, these are states of you know 10 to the power of 23 particles, and they can be expressed with just a few variables like temperature, pressure, volume, entropy, and so on and so forth. And so that's the really remarkable pro property of equilibrium states. And you know, the whole field of thermodynamics is built on equilibrium states. Now, most, most things that uh, in nature or in our bodies or whatever, they are out of equilibrium, okay? And so um, in stochastic thermodynamics, you can really deal with models that are out of equilibrium, okay? The other thing that, you know, again, Difference in stochastic thermodynamics are fluctuations, which come from the fact that there are just a few degrees of freedom. The system can be out of equilibrium. And another major difference is like finite time. You know, if you remember your, I don't know, here in the US, it's called thermal physics. I don't know if you still have a thermodynamics course and a statistical physics course separately. When I did it in my undergrad in Brazil, they were separated. But now at least here in the US, they just have one called thermal physics. So if you did your thermal physics course, I mean, if you remember correctly, you never see time during the whole course, right? It's probably one of the few physics courses that there is no time, time never shows up. And um, the reason there is no time is that if you wanna think about a model in, in, in standard thermodynamics, you really have to think about a quasi static model. Okay? Whatever change you do, you have, you have to change things very, very slowly so that your system can always equilibrate and always be in equilibrium state. So if you change a parameter in your system, like change the pressure a little bit, you just wait the system to relax to equilibrium and then you keep changing the parameter, okay? So in a sense, if you wanna uh, treat a model analytically in thermodynamics, you have to consider a quasi-static model, okay? That moves very slowly. So that means infinite time, or at least time must be very, very long compared to whatever relaxation time you have. Now, in stochastic thermodynamics, we don't really have this constraint, okay? I mean, we can do process at finite time and you know, most process that happen either man-made or in nature, they are finite time. So, you know, so stochastic thermodynamics is basically a generalization of thermodynamics to systems that can be small and therefore have large fluctuations. The systems, systems that can be out of equilibrium and systems that can operate at finite time. And this is a generalization of thermodynamics that basically started in the mid nineties, okay? And, you know, before that, um, before stochastic thermodynamics, a, another kind of framework to treat systems out of equilibrium was linear response theory, okay? 
you know, linear response theory is considerably older. That is the Gonzaga reciprocity relations. Okay, this is 60s and 70s. So that's a little bit older, but that's a precursor, if you will, of stochastic thermodynamics. But again, when we were people were doing uh, linear response theory, they were not really thinking about, they didn't know about things like the fluctuation theorem, which again, the fluctuation theorem is what really, really started stochastic thermodynamics. And I mean, what's really the main point of stochastic thermodynamics or what would be the main objective maybe? The main objective in my view are maybe a main thing in stochastic thermodynamics is that once you accept that, you know, uh, or once you, you build a theory that is able to deal with systems that have large fluctuations that can operate out of equilibrium, a very, very important question is, what are the universal constraints that these fluctuations must fulfill, okay? What happens is that these fluctuations, they do happen, but they, they, they are constrained, okay? They cannot be anything. There are some re relations that tell you how these fluctuations should be, okay? There must be some inequality or some equality that they fulfill. So, you know, the big, big, uh, I mean, in physics, we always want to find universal relations, right? And we are want to find some universal laws, universal rule. And a big, big question in stochastic thermodynamics is what are the universal relations that fluctuations must fulfill, okay? And again, one big relation that really started the field is the fluctuation theorem, which I'm going to talk about here. Again, that's really easy to prove, okay? You're going to see that. Uh, and the other relation is the thermodynamic constraint relation, which is also a universal relation about fluctuations. That is for 2000, that's from 2015, okay? It's much more recent. And that one, oh, I should write the whole thing. Thermodynamic uncertainty relation. And that's from 2015, okay? And that was discovered by myself and Udo Zeifert in 2015, okay? So that's another relation, I guess. So what these two relations have in common is that they are very, very universal constraints that fluctuations must fulfill, okay? They cannot be anything, but they must fulfill this thing, okay? Okay, so, you know, this course is gonna be about stochastic thermodynamics and I'm gonna start from the very basics. Again, there will be no attempt of being uh, of covering all the math and everything. I will try to make the math as simple as possible. I always try to focus on a very simple model, which will be the model of a single enzyme. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, and uh, I probably give you, I mean, I'll send some list of references to the organizers and then they can pass it to you by the end of the course, okay? So I'm not gonna write any reference during the lectures, but I will send some list of references after so that, you know, if you are interested, you can further study the field. Okay, so let's start. And our starting point is gonna be the master equation. Let me do this. And please ask questions if you want. So the master equation. Okay, so first thing, what is a stochastic process? So a stochastic process is just a sequence of random variables indexed by time, okay? So, you know, you have like X0, X1, where this subscript represents time somehow, okay? That's a stochastic process. And you know, here is stochasticity. It comes from the fact that, I mean, we think about some sort of mesoscopic description, right? Again, if you think about the molecular motor, you know, the molecular motor will fluctuate because of these collisions between the, the smaller water molecules and the molecular motor. It makes the molecular motor, even if it on average moves forward, sometimes it gives steps backward, okay? So that's where the stochasticity will come from here. <clears throat> I probably should say, okay, the kind of experimental systems which the theory of stochastic thermodynamics apply include molecular motor or any single enzyme experiment. Uh, I mean, a lot of stuff in molecular biology, like biochemical reactions and everything. Um, 
quantum dots if you are in a spectrum regime, if they are like weakly coupled, what else? Uh, colloidal particles. I mean, those are probably the main sorts of experimental setups where this kind of things I'm going to talk about have been, or at least could be tested, OK? All right. Um, OK, so that's the stochastic process. And you know, in uh, stochastic thermodynamics, we deal with Markovian process most of the time. Let's just use this singular, it's easy. Markovian process. And, you know, a Markovian process is such that the probability to observe Xn given the whole previous trajectory, Xn minus one, Xn minus two, up to X zero is going to be P of Xn, Xn minus one. Okay, that's the Markovian property. Again, this is the conditional probability. So it, it, what this equation says is that the probability to be in state Xn is given by, I mean, given the whole trajectory only depends on the last step of the trajectory, okay? Everything else is irrelevant, okay? So Markov means kind of you do not remember your whole past. You just have to remember the, the very last state you were in, okay? So that's the Markovian property. Now, if the process is Markovian and time is, time is continuous, the variables are discrete, then it's possible to show, which I'm not gonna do here, that uh, the system will fulfill the master equation, okay? Now let's write down this master equation again. This is an equation that will give you the evolution of the probability to be in a certain state. Um, and again, this equation will be true if your process is Markovian, if the states are discrete and time is continuous. Okay, so I, I represent states by I and J, okay? So what's a state? Well, okay, so if you think about a molecular motor, a colloidal particle, the state would be the position of the motor or the position of the particle. If you think about an enzyme burning ATP, the state would be either the enzyme having ATP bound to it or the enzyme not having ATP bound to it. If you think about the IZ model, the state of would be the orientation of the spin, right? If you have any spins in your system, you'd have two to the power of n states. So that's a state, okay? That's pretty much if you did your thermal physics course, whatever you call the microstate there, that should be what I'm calling a state here. Um, and I mean, those states, they are in a certain sense, uh, Meso states in the sense that again, if you think about the molecular motor, it's made of many atoms. Okay, when I'm thinking about a state, I'm not thinking about every single atom in the molecular motor. I'm just want to know what's, what is the position of the motor in the track, for example. Okay, so there is always some sort of coarse graining when you think about states here at this level. Okay, so W I J will represent a transition rate from I. To J, okay, <clears throat> and this would be transition probability per unit of time, and so the master equation, which I guess maybe most of you have seen already, is dPi dt is sum over all states J different than I, P J of t W J I minus P I of t W I J, okay. So, you know, the first term in the equation, and this term here, is all possibilities of going, going into state i. So I am at some state j, and then I go to state i. And the second term are all possibilities of leaving state i, okay? That's a pretty simple equation. And again, if you start with something called the chapman komogorov equation, and you know you, you, you have a process that is Markovian, time is continuous, states are discrete, states are discrete, you can show that your if if your process is Markovian, your your probability again pi of t is probability of state i, okay? The probability of the system to be in state i, right? At time t. Okay. Now there are also 
you know, the, the variables i and j could be continuous. The master equation is still valid. It's not a problem. Um, there are like Langevin equations, which again, they can always be obtained as a limit of a master equation. So, you know, my choice for dealing with discrete process in this course is just because I think the math is simplified. I also somehow like more discrete than continuous. But another point which I would say is that uh, at least from the process, for the kind of process we use in stochastic thermodynamics, the, if you think about a Langevin equation, it can always be obtained as a limit of a master equation, okay? If it's, okay, if it's, uh, maybe not all of them, but I mean, I, I do think that at least the ones using stochastic dynamics, all of them can be obtained as a limit of a master equation. But, you know, if you think about a continuous process for of an equation, it could be obtained as a limit of the master equation, okay? But, okay, so that's the master equation. Again, soon in this course, we're gonna see a, we're gonna see a particular model. But for now, again, if you wanna imagine a model, Again, this state I could be the position of a colloidal particle, the position of a molecular motor, the state of an enzyme. If you think about the IZ model, it would be the orientation of the spins, okay? So those are the states, all right? And typically, I'm imagine a case of a finite number of states. So, you know, I would be equal to one, two, up to omega. So I have omega states, okay? So number of states in this course is gonna be omega. Okay, so... Uh, or in these lectures, it's not really a course, right? It's only three lectures. All right, so that's the probability to be state i at time t. That's the master equation. It's a linear equation. And when I say it's a linear equation, it's linear in p, okay? The probability p, you can see it's linear in p. So, you know, in principle, you can try to solve this equation. In general, it's kind of hard, but I mean, you could do that. Now, typically it's convenient to write this equation in a matrix form. So I can write a vector P as, you know, P1, P2, up to P omega. That would be P of T. And let's just put the T here. All right, that would be a vector. And so I can write this equation as the master equation there. Of course, this is true for all y, okay? And j. All right. Um, I can write this equation as dp dt is equal to w p of t, okay? Where, of course, now this w here is going to be a matrix, and this W can be written as W equals to. Oh, I should have done something. So a convenient way of writing this equation is the following. So let me rewrite. I'm going to rewrite this equation here, okay? So that you can understand what W is. So deep di dt is equal to sum in j different than I. So those are the terms that go into a state I, P, J of T, W, J, I of T, W, J, I only, minus R, I, P, I of T, okay? Where R, I is equal to the sum in J different than I, W, I, J, okay? That's called the escape rate. So it's kind of a more convenient way of writing this equation, okay? You know, now, I run write this equation in the vector form, dp dt equals to wp, right? Where the vector p, the, the entries of the vector p are the pi's. And so my w, the diagonal elements of my w are gonna be minus r1, minus r2, minus our omega, okay? Then here, I'm gonna have W of two to one, W of three to one, W of omega to one. And here I'm gonna give W one two up to W one omega. So you can more or less guess how the matrix is gonna look like. Now W, 
big W is called a stochastic matrix, okay? I know this is very mathematical, but I mean, those are very basic mathematical elements of stochastic thermodynamics, okay? So, you know, I'll try to make this course as no mathematical as possible, but those are very, very basic things about stochastic thermodynamics. So basically I can write the master equation with this matrix W, which is stochastic matrix. Now, what are the properties of this matrix, okay? So the sum of the elements in a column is zero, okay? So let's call this column sum is zero. So, you know, if I do R1, which is just R i is the sum for all W i j and I sum all elements here, I'll get zero, okay? Same thing for all columns, okay? That should be true for all columns. Okay, that's a very important property of the stochastic matrix. Now, the max eigenvalue of the matrix is zero. Okay, that's, I mean, this kind of matrix is a Pehon Frobenius matrix, so you can show it has a unique maxing and value. And if the matrix is stochastic, again, the definition of a stochastic matrix is the diagonal elements are negative, the off diagonal elements are all positive, so all Ws must be positive, okay? Transition rates are always positive. And the sum of the elements in a column must give zero, okay? That's, those are the properties of a stochastic matrix. If the matrix is stochastic, it has a maximum eigenvalue value that is zero, and uh, all other eigenvalues values have a real part that is negative. They can have an imaginary part also, but their, their real part is always negative, okay? And, you know, in stochastic thermodynamics, there is a property which is, you know, WIJ, the WIJs, they can be zero, okay? The transition rate from one state to another can be zero. Like for example, you know, for a molecular motor, I cannot jump from position one to position 10, right? I, I must jump from position one to position two. And so the transition rates where I would do a, a jump that I jump 10 positions in a single jump do not are zero. So no, transition rates can be zero. But, but if WIJ is different from zero, then WJI must also be different from zero, okay? That is not something true for the stochastic process, but that's something that is true in stochastic thermodynamics, okay? So in stochastic thermodynamics, at least most of the time, we deal with processes that have this property, okay? If, one to, if you can do a transition from one state to another, then you can do the backward transition, okay? That's the same equivalent thing. There is a chemical reaction that takes you from one point to another, then there must be a reverse chemical reaction, even if it's very, very unlikely, but you know, that there must be some finite non-zero thing that you know you can do the reverse reaction. Okay, that's always that's a mathematical property in stochastic thermodynamics. It's an important mathematical property. Again, it will guarantee that you have a unique steady state and so on and so forth. I don't want to enter the mathematics too much, but you know, something to remember about the master equation is that there is a stochastic matrix, the max again value of this matrix is zero. Okay. And you know, this property here again is not a mathematical property of stochastic process, but rather it's a mathematical property that we assume to be true in um, stochastic thermodynamics. Now, you know, um, maybe the first postulate of stochastic thermodynamics would be that the dynamics is Markovian and uh, follows either a master equation or a launch of equation, or whatever. So that would be maybe the first postulate of stochastic thermodynamics. Any questions? All right. Okay, so given that we now know what's the master equation, we can talk about a stationary state, which again is a very important concept in stochastic thermodynamics. Okay, so what's a stationary state? A stationary state, do I have a question? No, all right. No question. So, yeah. No, no, no there's no question. Yeah. All right. So in a stationary state, the derivative of course becomes zero, right? That's the definition of a stationary state. So basically from the 
let's do the vector thing here. So, you know, and for the individualized, I'm just gonna call it PSI. That's the stationary solution of the mass equation. And so basically I can write a W PS is equal to zero. So what's the stationary state distribution? It's the right in vector. associated with the in-game volume. Okay, so, I mean, a main problem in, in generally non-equilibrium stat Mac, right? I mean, a main thing is that this probability distribution, if you have a non-equilibrium steady state, okay, it's not gonna be the Boltzmann distribution, it's gonna be something else. And in many, many problems, you kind of wanna find this distribution, okay? That is, you know, again, for many different problems, it's very, very desirable that you find a stationary state distribution. And how do you find this stationary distribution? Well, you have this matrix, this W matrix, and all you have to do is to find the in-game vector associated with the in-game value zero, okay? That's pretty much all you do. And so that's kind of a very important relation that the stationary state distribution of your system is gonna be the in-game value or the in-game vector associated with the in-game value zero. Now, notice that I said right in-game value. So, you know, the W matrix, this it's not a symmetric matrix, so it's not, a, you know, if you wanna think about quantum mechanics, it's not a Hermitian matrix, okay? So the right thing and values and the left thing and values are in generally different. So, you know, the matrix is also left thing and values. So the left thing and value associated with, uh, with uh, the thing and value zero would be just, you know, one, 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 just a bunch of ones, okay? If you do that, W, you're gonna get zero. That's because the sums of the elements in a column are zero, right? That's pretty straightforward to show. But you know, in general, left and right in vectors are different. So, you know, dealing with this matrix can be something a little bit more complicated than dealing, for example, with a matrix in quantum mechanics. Okay. So they are they have this they have this property that you know the sums of the elements of a column is zero. That simplifies your life a lot, but they also have this complication that you know they are not necessarily symmetric. Okay. In most of the cases they are not if you are out of equilibrium they're not going to be symmetric. Okay. All right, if you're in equilibrium, they might not be symmetric also, but they can in principle be symmetrized, okay? All right, so again, those are the very basic properties. Again, let me talk a little bit more about this map. So let's say we do the case omega equals to two, okay? So I have only three states. It could be one spin, the spin can either be up or down, okay, for example. And so if I do that, my master equation will be dp1 of t dt is equal to w to one d two of t minus minus w one two p one of t. But of course the p two of t is just one minus p one of t, right? Because um because you know I just have two probabilities. And of course so if I did not write down but since pi is a probability if I sum from i equals to one and t omega pi of t, I must always get one, okay? The probability distribution is normalized. Okay, so that's a true state model. And, um, you know, this is an equation I can solve. So first let's find the stationary state distribution. The stationary state distribution is gonna be one minus P1S W21 minus W12. P1S is equal to zero, right? That's the stationary solution of the master equation. And uh, okay. That's the stationary solution of the master equation, which will give me P1S is equal to W21 over W12 plus W21, okay? So again, that's a general solution of the master equation. Again, in general, solving the master equation is very hard, okay? If you have system with many, many states, then it becomes literally impossible to find an exact solution. If you have a system with a small number of states, if it's true, it's super easy. If it's true, it's a little bit harder, but still quite easy. Something you could do in Mathematica, four, five, six, and you know, up to 10, maybe you can solve these things. But you know, if you have something with many, many degrees of freedom, then, I mean, 
this exact solution becomes pretty much impossible, okay? But in this case, you can solve it exactly. That's the stationary distribution. And you know, in this case, you can even find the P1 of T exactly. So P1 of T, I mean, you can do this calculation. It's gonna be P1S, one minus each of the power of minus lambda T plus P0, P0 being the initial distribution, okay? So that's my initial condition. E to the power of minus lambda t, where lambda is just the sum of the two rates, w12 plus w21, okay? So that's the solution of the master equation. So basically, if I was to plot this p1 of t as a function of time, and this is a plot you really want to remember. So let's say I start at some p0, and let's say p1s is below p0. I should probably call it p10, right? It's probably a better idea. Let's call it p10. Okay. So again, p10 is just the initial condition, okay? And basically, I would decay exponentially to my stationary solution, okay? That's what happens. And I mean, okay, that's a true state model. It's a very simple model, but you know, uh, I mean, you could say the same thing is gonna happen, happens for any omega. Okay, the difference of course now is that if I have a more complicated model with 10 states, with 20 states, 1000 states, whatever it is, I mean, of course I have many, many different tangent values and many, many different tangent effects and things are gonna get more complicated, but pretty much what happens is we start at some initial condition and you're gonna decay exponentially to some uh, stationary distribution, okay? And again, solving the true state model is very instructive because, you know, that's pretty much what happens all the time, okay? That's pretty much what's gonna happen for larger systems. Of course, larger systems can have a lot of finite time behavior that's important. For instance, you know, the eigenvalues values can be imaginary. Not for true states, for true states, they cannot. They are, they, they, this lambda here is the eigenvalue value of the matrix, okay? So one eigenvalue value is zero and the other eigenvalue. value then you have that gives you a decay rate, the, the, how fast you decay to the stationary state, okay? Which is kind of an important problem in stochastic process. You kind of want to know what's your relaxation time. So this eigenvalue of the matrix that is not zero. So the next thing in value kind of gives you a decay time, okay? But you know, this eigenvalue value, they can be imaginary. And I mean, these Engen values and Engen vectors, in this case, for example, imaginary Engen values, these are very important for physical things or for biological things, if you will. So these are quite important in biochemical oscillations, okay? I'm not gonna really talk about that. All I'm saying is that these mathematical things I'm talking about here all have clear physical implications. So, you know, the imaginary part of the Engen value, typically, if you have a biochemical oscillation, by that I mean something like a circadian clock, okay? And I could imagine human beings, we all have this 24 hours kind of clock in ourselves. And, you know, if you have biochemical oscillations and they are stochastic somehow, and, and you want to make a mathematical analysis through them, typically they will, we use Markov process. And if you want to calculate, for example, the period of oscillation, you can do that by calculating the Engen value of the matrix. Okay, so the Engen value of the matrix will have imaginary part if you have oscillations, and this imaginary part is going to give you the period of oscillations while the real part's gonna give you the decay time of the oscillations. And this decay will happen because of fluctuations, okay? All I wanna tell you here is just that, you know, these Engen values and Engen vectors of the matrix can have very, very important physical implications, okay? Those are important mathematical objects that can have physical implications. And the other message here is, if you solve the true state model, you kind of know what's gonna happen for most systems, which is they will start at some initial distribution and decay exponentially to the stationary state, okay? That's pretty much what happens. Okay, I mean, another problem that, you know, Engen values and Engen vectors is the Mipemba effect. Again, I'm not giving reference here, but I will have a list of references. That's kind of something that has received attention in stochastic thermodynamics. Now, the Mipemba effect is the idea that, I mean, this was first observed in water. And the fact is that, let's say I wanna, 
uh, heat up something. And in one case, I start with a temperature. And in the other case, oh, sorry, let's say I want to cool down water, OK? Let's say I want to cool down water to a certain temperature. And in one case, I start with a temperature. In the other case, I start with a higher temperature. The Pemba effect was the observation that when I start at a higher temperature, the cooling down is faster, okay? So I can cool something down faster starting at a higher temperature, which is a very non-intuitive thing. And you know, there is a paper about that in stochastic thermodynamics, and there is an explanation to this effect in terms of looking at the Engen values and Engen vectors of this stochastic matrix, okay? So, you know, two main measures I wanted to give here were that if you solve the tree state model, you kind of know what's going to happen. The tree state model is very simple, of course, but you know, if you have more states, what happens is we start at some initial distribution and you're going to decay exponentially to your stationary distribution. The other message is that these Engen values and Engen vectors can have, they, they are in some situations very important physical objects, okay? Or they translate into physical objects. All right. And okay. So again, the stationary state is the Engen vector associated with the Engen value zero. It's something that can be calculated. And now let's discuss the idea of detailed balance. So my master equation was dpi dt is equal to sum in j different than i pi. Now I'm using the stationary state already. Wij minus pj wji is equal to zero, right? That's the stationary state solution of the master equation. Remember that the dpi as dt is equal to zero, right? Okay, so. That's the stationary state solution. And now one possibility is that each term in the sum is zero. So that would mean that pi s w i j minus p j s w j i. My J and my S sometimes might look similar, but they are supposed to be different. So PI WIJ minus PJ WJI, that's going to be zero for all pairs IJ. Okay. So for all pairs IJ, this is equal to zero. And that's what's called detailed balance. Okay. So again, that's a strong condition. It's much stronger than the steady state condition. The steady state is just that the, when you do the whole sum, you have, must get zero. But the detailed balance condition is that every single term in the sum in J must be zero, okay? That's what's called detailed balance. And if, so I'm gonna call this DB in these lectures. So if that is the balance, then the PIS, is yes. the PI equilibrium. It's the equilibrium distribution or the system is said to be in an equilibrium steady state, okay? PI equilibrium, which you know, is each to the power of minus beta EI over Z, beta being one over KBT. Now I should say that KB equals to one here, okay? So KB is going to be one all the time. Sometimes I might write KB just because it's convenient to write KB there. But if you don't see KB, it's because it's equal to one, okay? Most of the time in this course, KB is one. And there is kind of a reason for that. It's, you know, typically in stat mac we define entropy with a KB. So, you know, if you think about channel entropy, you know, the stat, the stat mac in stat mac we typically do entropies minus KB, uh, sum in I, PI, ln of PI, right? But I do think that, uh, at least from the perspective of stochastic thermodynamics, it's better to define entropy without the KB. 
also when you want to connect with information tier that will make your life easier so you know but the way of going you know out of this sort of discussion whether i should have a kb in the entropy or not is to just make kb equals to one okay so kb is going to be equal to one kb being the boltzmann constant okay and t being the temperature uh z here is the partition function right it's just the sum in j each to the power of minus beta ej again j goes from one to omega because i have omega states okay again if I have detailed balance, then I have an equilibrium in steady state and my probability distribution, my stationary distribution is just the equilibrium distribution in the Boltzmann. One. Now this EI could be more generally like a free energy. So, you know, you could have different, it could have like also chemical potential. So it would be a bit more complicated, but in general, just have an equilibrium distribution if detailed balance is fulfilled, okay? Now, Probably you might have seen the tail balance written in this form. So if I do PI equilibrium W IJ is equal to PJ equilibrium WJI. So I can write W IJ over WJI is equal to the power of minus beta EJ minus the i okay and i'm guessing if you have seen the tail balance you might have seen this relation here as a detail balance condition which again comes from the fact that you know probably a mathematician will prefer to call this thing here the tail balance and many times a physicist mainly if you have done like uh, i don't know metropolis or metropolis algorithm of the IZ model or whatever in your life you probably have seen this as a tail balance relation now the WIJ is their transition rates, okay? And, the, you know, a particular WIJ also depends on kinetic parameters, which, you know, is something that is very model dependent in a sense, but the ratios of the WIJs are just determined by the difference of the energies, okay? Which again, is gonna be true only if you have uh, detailed balance. Now, an important thing of the equilibrium distribution is that it's independent of kinetic parameters, okay? So, you know, kinetic parameter, for example, could say that for a certain pair IJ, the transition is much faster than for some other pair of states, okay? That's, that would be the role of, for example, kinetic parameters. So for example, if I multiply WIJ and WJ by 10, both of these transitions are much faster than maybe other transitions in your network, but it's still the ratio of mass of the tail balance, okay? And how fast these transitions are will depend on kinetic parameters. Now, the very important property of the equilibrium distribution is that it's totally independent of kinetic parameters, okay? So whether, if, I, if I make a particular pair of states faster than another pair of states, that's okay. I still keep the same distribution and my equilibrium distribution is completely independent of this kind of change I do. So the equilibrium distribution does not really care about kinetic parameters. Again, equilibrium states are particularly simple to deal with because if you have a very complicated system with many, many degrees of freedom, then you have a zoo of kinetic parameters. And the fact that the equilibrium distribution does not depend on kinetic parameters make the theory of equilibrium thermodynamics very, very nice, nice. Very, it's very pleasuring, okay? So if in the end you just have these few parameters to deal with, you don't have all these kinetic parameters, while when you deal with non-equilibrium steady states, then the distribution becomes dependent on kinetic parameters, okay? And, you know, if you deal with a very complicated model, then not so, I mean, if you deal with like, I don't know, 10 states, a model with 10 states, then your distribution is gonna have an expression that, you know, it will barely fit the page. So if you calculate it on Mathematica, it's just going to be huge. And it depends on all these kinetic parameters, okay? Which is kind of a not so nice thing. Okay, so, you know, if PI, if, you know, the tail balance is not fulfilled, it's only, so let's define JIJ as PIS WIJ minus P, J, S, W, J, I. So here I finished the tail balance. Now, if this quantity here is different from zero, again, let's write it again. The master equation was sum from J different than I 
j i j is equal to zero, okay? So if I sum over all j, I do get zero, but each individual element is not zero. In that case, if that's the case, then PIS is said to be a non-equilibrium distribution, okay? And again, maybe one major difference between this non-equilibrium distribution and equilibrium one is that it will depend on kinetic parameters, okay? It will depend on these WIJs, not only on their ratios, but it will depend on the particular mean. If I multiply a pair by 10, that's probably gonna, when I say a pair, I multiply WIJ and WJ by 10, that's probably gonna really affect my probability distribution, okay? Now, the JIJ is called probability current. And so the presence of a probability currents is, um, is really uh, the signature of a steady state, okay? So if you have a non-equilibrium steady state, you must have probability currents. Now, the reason you call this a current, it's really because this equation here can be seen as Kirchhoff law. Now, if you remember Kirchhoff law when you did electromagnetism, it's about conservation of current. And you know, if you imagine the states as, as resistors, okay? And you know, you think about the currents, the current going through then, uh, it's going to fulfill a conservation law similar to the one that you would find in an electric circuit, okay? So that's why you typically call these things a current. And this equation here can be seen as something as the Kirchhoff law, right? If I think, if I think about all the currents living in a state, they must sum up to zero, okay? Which is kind of an important property that I'm not going to discuss in any detail here, but you know, but probability currents are very important, and they are a signature of a steady state. And a physical characteristic of a steady state is the presence of a thermodynamic flux. Okay. And a thermodynamic flux is I forgot the word flux. <laughs> is a linear combination of JJs, okay? So what's a the thermodynamic flux? For example, if you think about an enzyme binding ATP, it's the rate at which I burn ATP. If you think about a molecular motor on a track, it could be like the speed of the motor, okay? If you think about a quantum dot, it would be the flux of electrons to the quantum dot, right? The quantum dot is just a point that can either have an electron or no electron. And I mean, this quantum dot might be connected to two different reservoirs and the flux of electrons from one reservoir to the other reservoir through the quantum dot, um, the quantum dot. is gonna be a thermodynamic flux, okay? So all thermodynamic fluxes, which are, I could argue that thermodynamic fluxes are the most important physical observables in stochastic thermodynamics. They are all linear combinations of probability currents, okay, of this JIJ currents. Um, and, you know, probably the- There, you uh, hear me? There, yeah, you hear me? Yeah, can you Yes. Uh, I have, I have two, two things. One, um, we have 10 minutes more uh, for you, and then there will be 10 minutes of questions. And okay. uh, second thing is, uh, okay, I have a suggestion for your talk, because we, 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 so we are trying to follow your, your handwritten notes, but, I have a suggestion that could you draw um, the diagrams of a Markov process and, and say there what is the state, what is a current, because maybe this is helpful here for us. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I wasn't the person that I have two hours story, so I thought it was from five to, it was not from 12 to two, I'm sorry. So, because yeah. that was the next thing I'm gonna do, but I don't know if I'll yeah. have time if I have, sorry, yeah. We, uh, we have to break in the middle because of some time constraints. We, we will explain later. So oh, okay. We, we, we can do only one hour today because we are very delayed. Okay, sure, sure, that's fine. Because that's the next thing I was gonna do, but so how, how much time do I still have? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, that should be okay. I should have time to do that. Okay, so yeah, that was the next thing I was gonna do is your suggestion. Um, I was gonna do a specific model now. Uh, and again, I will continue this next lecture, okay, if I don't. I have enough time to finish today. So let me just see what I am. Okay. So I discussed the balance and stationary states. Now, <laughs> as an example, I'm going to talk about a three state model. 
and that's going to be the model for a single enzyme. Now things that are going to be less abstract, and I'm going to talk about the specific physical system. Okay, so the physical situation is that I have a single enzyme. Okay. Again, the experiment I would be doing is a single enzyme in a solution. So there's just one enzyme, okay? And the enzyme is gonna be burning some substrate S and it's gonna be producing some product P. Okay, so, you know, the most, Common S probably would be ATP. And the most common product P would be ADP plus PI, okay? And you know, the chemical reaction that's going on is uh, the enzyme takes an S from the solution and then it becomes ES, then it becomes ZP. It transforms the substrate into the product. And then it releases the product in the solution. Okay. Now the reversal chemical reactions are also possible. They are just less likely. Okay. Now I'm going to think about a non-equilibrium steady state. What happens in a non-equilibrium steady state? So that the assumption here is that the concentration. So again, there is just one E. Okay. There is one single molecule. It's just one single enzyme in this experiment. And again, that's something you could do experimentally. Okay. Um, S concentration. of S and P is fixed. Now there are two ways you could do that. Either you could assume in a regime where the numbers of S and P is very, very large. And you know whatever the enzyme is doing is just too small for this time scale. So let's say I would have to rate a whole year for the enzyme to change this uh, concentration in a substantial manner such that uh, I would see something, some changing concentration, and I only want to observe this for 10 minutes, okay? Or uh, you, you could imagine that there is, whenever the enzyme is taking S and producing P, I'm always uh, taking P out of the solution and putting S in, okay? So there is an external thing keeping these concentrations fixed, okay? But the idea is that even if the enzyme is more likely to take an S and transform it into a P, it can take a P and transform it into an S, that's less likely. But uh, the enzyme is doing that, but I'm assuming both concentrations are fixed, okay? So whatever the enzyme is doing is not relevant enough to change what's happening in the solution, okay? And that's the typical situation of a non-equilibrium steady state, okay? Okay, so how to represent this model in terms of a master equation that we had before? So how does the diagram look like now? So I have three states. One state is E, the other state is ES, and the other state is EP, okay? So, you know, if I do the if I do the transitions there, if I go from if I go from here to here in this diagram below there, it's the equivalent of doing the cycle. So first from me I go to yes, then from yes I go to P, and then I'm back to E. Okay. Now please note that these things here, this thing here, and this thing here, they have to do with the solution. Okay. Your system E is the system. This plus S and plus P are related to the reservoir, okay? So of course there's a change in the external reservoir, which again is irrelevant because I'm somehow keeping these concentrations of S and P fixed. There's just too many of them. So whatever the enzyme is doing is not that relevant. But if I think about this model in terms of a network of states, I just have three states. And you know, if I go from if I go from left to right in this in this scheme here. It means that I do this cycle in the clockwise direction. And if I go from, from right to left, it means I do the cycle in the anti-clockwise direction, okay? So that's the model. And you know, if I wanna write this model, do I still have time? Yes, uh, five minutes. Five minutes, five. okay, that's enough. Okay, so now all I wanna do, and again, I'm gonna start next lecture from this example. All I wanna do is to write this uh, in terms of, the master equation I had before, okay? So I can call this state state one. I'm gonna call this state state two. And 
this is state state three. Okay. Again, if I think at, in terms of this diagram here, I will have W one two okay. here. Andre, I have a question. So just to read it. What yeah. Before the arrows should be also on the other direction, the clock and counterclockwise, right? Sure, sure, sure. I can always have. Yeah. Yeah, both things are possible. Again, the clockwise one is going from left to right in the figure above, and going from right to left would be anti clockwise. Thank you. Okay, so I have three states now, right? And, you know, if I want to write down my master equation now, I will have my vector P of T is going to be, you know, P1 of T. Let me go back to black, sorry. P2 of T, P3 of T. Okay. And, you know, my matrix W is just going to be minus R1, W1, 2, W1, 3. W21 minus R2, W23. Then I have minus R3, W31, and W32. Okay. Okay, so you know, description till now or before this part was very abstract. I was just telling what's the master equation again. I just made a few very basic observations about it. Um, but, you know, if you think about a physical model, that's probably the simplest model you can think of, like a three-state model. And again, the physics here is there is a single enzyme. It's it's burning ATP, okay? It takes the ATP and, and, and transform it to ADP plus PI. And so if I want to translate this into the language of the master equation, that would be these Ws, which are the transition rates of these chemical reactions. There will be three states. Again, the state of the system is the state of the enzyme, okay? Whatever happens to the reservoir, whether it's a plus or a plus P in this equation doesn't really matter. Okay, that's a property of the reservoir. And if I want a master equation to that, um, that's that will be my master equation. Okay, that will be a three-state system. That's how the network will look like. Like drawing these networks is always something very useful. Of course, there are models to which drawing these networks would be impossible. If there, if there is a large number of states, it becomes very hard to draw these networks. For this one, it's very easy. And, you know, now I'm going to, not now, but next lecture, I'm going to discuss the concept of a current and state balance within this model. And I mean, a very important question that we are going to discuss is how are the Ws related to thermodynamic So, you know, we saw that for the tail balance, right? For the tail balance, we had this relation, okay? This relation tells us how the transition rates, Ws, are related to energies, differences when the tail balance is fulfilled. But, you know, for a general non equilibrium steady state, the question is how they relate these transition rates, W, with some physical parameter, okay? Which is related to this chemical reaction here, okay? That's, you know, again, next lecture, I will discuss the three-state model, I will discuss these quantities, the current and everything, and how the Ws relate to physical parameters in a specific physical context, okay? All right, so that's, I will finish it here. And then I guess I continue tomorrow, right? If I'm not wrong. Yeah. Okay, Andre. okay so there's time for questions. Super skilled, so I can just talk like this. Or... Yes. Better you get close. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, so I have I have a doubt when you were presenting the, the concept of the tail balance. Yeah, I, I was kind of following everything, but for me, it's weird how you. I mean, okay, you define your process in terms of these reaction rates, but then do you, can you always define a temperature and an energy energetic landscape? For me, it's like 
it's weird, no? You either define your model in terms of, of rates or in terms of a uh, Hamiltonian, right? Well, I mean, so barely I should have said that, but you know, in, in stochastic thermodynamics, the system is out of equilibrium. Okay, I don't have to write that. So the system is out of equilibrium, but your reservoir is always in equilibrium, okay? So while my enzyme, which is my system, can be out of equilibrium, this reservoir here that has fixed concentrations of S and P, it's in equilibrium, meaning that the reservoir, the solution where the S and P and the enzyme are has a fixed temperature T, and the chemical potential of S, which is the chemical potential of ATP, and the chemical potential of the product P would be the chemical potential of ADP plus the chemical potential of P. Those are all thermodynamic quantities which are fixed, okay? So now I define my model in terms of the transition rates, but as I told you, I want to discuss how these transition rates are related to physical parameters or to thermodynamic parameters. And it turns out that these transition rates, they're related to, for example, the temperature of the reservoir and the chemical potentials of P and S. So, you know, I mean, the right way to maybe answer the question would be that I define my model in terms of the transition rates, and these transition rates will have to fulfill certain relations. They are, they are, they are somehow constrained by these physical parameters of the reservoir. Okay, thank you. That, that is your question. Yeah, yeah, that's answered my question. Yeah. Which, which I'm going to do next lecture. I'm going to explain. This is a very good question. You know, it's a very important issue. But yeah, that's what I'm going to do next lecture is to show you how these transition rates are related to the physical parameters that of the reservoir. There's a question online. And, uh, okay. Can you read it for me? Yeah, this, this question is for you. Uh, it says, how does one write the detailed balance condition for continuum processes, which do not have finite number of states? I mean, so, I mean, uh, so, you know, if for a Lange of equation, that would mean that your, your, your noise will fulfill like a standard fluctuation dissipation relation. So I guess that would be the, the, the equivalent. But you could, I mean, if you are in the continuum, you could just, you know, discretize it. Mean, if you are talking about continuous space, just, you know, do P of X plus Delta and then make this continuous. I, I, it wouldn't be much different. It would be more or less the same. But you know, for if you are thinking about the Langev equation, the, the similar thing to be in equilibrium habitat balance would be that your noise, you know, the strength of the noise is is proportional to KBT. So that would be the equivalent thing. But you don't really have a exact thing like the T balance. I mean, yeah, that, that would be the equivalent thing of saying that your system fulfilled the T balance, I guess. Right. And other questions? Yes. Fine. It seems no more questions. So I think yes. I have a question, but from the beginning of the please, please, please. Hi. Hi. Okay. At the beginning, you talk about the dissipation theorem and the thermodynamic uncertainty relation. Yeah. Um, my question is uh, if there is like some relation between the two principles. Like, so, you know, uh, yeah, there, there is the fluctuation theorem, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Those two are different, okay? They are not the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, there's a relation between the thermodynamics. Uh, not really. I mean, thermodynamic and relation and, and the fluctuation theorem are different relations in the sense that one cannot be derived from the other. Yeah. Yeah, they are different relations, I would say. I mean, there is... I would say the relation between both, they are both universal constraint on fluctuations. Is that fluctuations they happen, but they cannot be anything. They must, they must obey certain constraints, and they are, I would say, two different constraints that fluctuations obey. But there is not a relation between them in the sense that one being derived from the other. No, yeah, I was meaning like in the um, interpretation, because like in the yeah, in the interpretation, I would just so have... what? Yeah, tell me. In the fluctuation theorem, you have like the, it gives you the meaning of the negative entropy production, no? 
And in the thermodynamic concentrated relation, you like you have like entropy production bounded the fluctuations. Yeah. In way. So I was asking like if there are like conceptual uh, relation between the two bounds. I would say the conceptual relation is that they're both they are both uh, constraints that fluctuations must fulfill. But apart from that, I wouldn't say anything beyond that. So okay. again, the fluctuation theorem tells you the probability distribution of entropy uh, must fulfill a constraint that P of S divided by P of minus S is equal to the power of S. And the, the fluctuation theorem tells you that the fluctuations of any current, including the entropy, is bounded by, you know, by the thermodynamic, by the rate of entropy production. So yeah, they are, they are different bounds, but the, the unifying principle between both is uh, they tell you what fluctuations, they tell you what fluctuations cannot be or what the fluctuations, you know. Fluctuations can be anything, but they must fulfill these constraints as long as they fulfill these constraints. So they're just two different constraints, I would say. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. I have a question about the imaginary uh, eigenvalue of the transition matrix. Since the master Sorry, equation, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, a master equation is a linear system, and and uh, shouldn't we have a unique uh, stationary state? So if we have some imaginary eigenvalue, uh, we will see some oscillations. But a master equation, uh, I, my intuition is that it should it should always have a single and stationary state, and we cannot. I mean, yeah. If as one thing is not, I mean, you know, the things that I mean. One thing, having a much that value and having a unique stationary state, both things can coexist. Okay, it's not a problem. But uh, so basically, the stationary state will be the eigen vector associated with the eigen value zero. So you know your 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 solution, your initial, you are starting initial state and you are going to the steady state exponential. That's always happening, even if you have an imaginary part. Having an imaginary part will just mean that there will be some. I mean, during that decay time, okay. So, you know, again, I, the figure I had was like a decay thing, right? From P0 to PS, right? P of T equals PS as a function of T. And, you know, that's also happened, but, you know, maybe during this decay time, there is some oscillatory behavior. Of course, if my system is very big, if I have many degrees of freedom, then, you know, this, this, this transient phenomena here can be something that takes a very long time, okay? It depends on how big my system is. So, you know, depending on the system, this transient thing can be something that is that takes a long time to happen. So, you know, even if I have an imaginary part, you do go to a steady state, but in the process of going to a steady state, there might be some oscillations or there will be some oscillations if you have an imaginary part, okay? But the, the both things are not excluded. So you, you can have an imaginary angle value but it's still, you are just going to go to a steady state. You're not going to reach a steady state and then oscillate, okay? You just oscillate before reaching the steady state. Okay. But you know, this before reaching the steady state can be a very, very long time if your system has many degrees of freedom, okay? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I think for the sake of time, we have to stop here and thank uh, Andre for the nice lecture. <laughs> Okay, Andre, and I think tomorrow we keep the two hours. It's just uh, okay. Day was a bit. That's last fine. Week. No, that's totally fine. I just didn't know, but uh, that's totally fine for my my. I, I mean, that's that works fine for me. So it my talk back is tomorrow at two, right? Yes. 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 All right. Okay. Yeah, next, thank you. Tomorrow. Tomorrow too. Okay. Sorry. It's lecture tomorrow. But, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. There's no change with the scale with me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so no, tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, three fifteen 